Yes, of course. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I know we're running a little behind schedule, so I'll try not to take up too much of your time. Um, today I'll be talking about tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these drugs. So several that come to mind are Sutent, Pazopinib, Serafinib, um, Enlita, just to name a few of the drugs that are out there, um, not only used for kidney cancers. Um, so you may have heard other cancer patients talk about these drugs as well. Um, the main side effects we really think about with these drugs are hand-foot syndrome or sores, um, sore calluses on the hands and feet. Um, sometimes mouth, I, I see some nods. <laughs> um, sometimes mouth sores, rashes, high blood pressure, um, hypothyroidism, so not a, a well-functioning um, thyroid gland. So these are just a few. Enlita is not on here, so I have to um, add that to my slides. Um, you know, in this era where we're using all of these oral therapies for cancer treatment, um, we're finding that med medicine compliance is actually a bigger and bigger issue. So a lot of healthcare providers are now, um, you know, having conferences and focusing a lot on compliance. Um, sometimes that's over compliance or under compliance. So at home, patients will sometimes say like, well, you know, I don't know if this is working or not, so I'm gonna take an extra one. Or, you know, I, I think this is too strong, so I'm gonna cut the dose in half. And it's really important to have a conversation with your oncologist before making any changes. Um, it's also really easy to forget sometimes to take your, your pills. You know, you're busy with your other activities. Sometimes you're working while you're taking these treatments. Um, so I've actually found some, some really cool apps. So I see a lot of people with iPhones today. Uh, so sometimes helping to record or having an alarm that's set every day to take your pills, especially if they're twice a day medications. It sounds really simple, but things like that can be really helpful um, to make sure that you're on track and using these drugs appropriately. We talked about some of the common side effects. Um, and the most important thing, I want to focus a lot on what you can do at home to help yourself with the side effects. But you know, picking up the phone and reporting them um, to your oncologist or the nurse practitioners or nurses who work in the clinic are, are really helpful. Um, the first thing we'll focus on is nausea and vomiting. Did anyone have nausea with some of these medications? A couple of nods. Yeah, so I, it's, I also want this to be a dialogue, so if you have any helpful tips along the way, please just raise your hand. Um, so a few drugs that can be used at home. Um, I have a few different drug classes, but a couple of the first things we think about are drugs like Ativan. Um, sometimes this is used as an anti-anxiety drug, but can be really helpful um, for nausea. The only problem is if you're someone who's out and about, it can cause um, sometimes drowsiness, dizziness, um, cannabinoids like Marinol can also be helpful not only for nausea and vomiting, but also to help stimulate appetite if that is a problem for you. Um, but once again, we can um, have issues if you're someone who's out and about and trying to function, um, it can be a difficult drug to take. Um, things like Compazine you may have heard of, um, that can also be a problem with drowsiness at, at times. Um, probably the most friendly drug for people to take if you're you know, someone who's active or if you're still working is something like Ondansetron or Zofran. Um, you can take it every, every eight hours. The main complications are constipation and headache, so you wanna take other things to combat the constipation. You may wanna take a stool softener every time you take one of these drugs. Um, with medicines, or there are always side effects, so you know, always something to consider. Um, but the things you know, most patients find most helpful are things that are not um, pharmacotherapy, or not taking a drug to help a side effect. So you're not on you know ten pills a day. Um, so things like eating small, frequent meals rather than three large meals a day can be very helpful. Um, less overwhelming, it's a little bit easier to digest. Um, sort of pre-medicating sometimes, so taking an anti-nausea pill 30 minutes to an hour before you're planning to have a meal. Um, avoiding fatty and spicy foods, so even though Chipotle is delicious, it's probably not the best thing to you know, eat when you're feeling nauseous. Um, and cold and room temperature foods are actually the best tolerated. Um, a lot of patients, when we see patients in the hospital, can't stand the smell of the um, tray coming because they sort of open the lid and that steam smell makes them sick. So um, things that, you know, like cold fruit, um, cold sandwiches, things like that um, can be really helpful. Ginger has not really been proven um, to help with nausea and vomiting, but people swear by it. So there are different things like ginger chews. You can find them at Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, places like that. 
Um, and then there are alternative therapies. I actually think these help probably more for distraction than anything else, um, like music therapy, aerobic exercise. I heard a lot of people saying they were using yogi, yoga, um, Reiki, things like that. Um, and those, a lot of patients report less nausea and vomiting when they're active. Um, unfortunately, diarrhea can also be a side effect of some of these therapies. Um, Imodium can be something to take over the counter. I see a few nods that can be a lifesaver at times. Um, and Lamotil, which is also a prescription medication. Um, probiotics are everywhere now. Um, I actually talked with a few of our pharmacists about probiotics and I was learning more. We see them actually in all different forms, but it, unless they're actually refrigerated, uh, many of them are not effective. So some of the tablets um, and things sort of on the shelf that are available are sometimes really expensive and usually are not as effective as things that you find in the refrigerated section um, of the grocery store or pharmacy. Um, and then just to follow up again with things that are not rela related to drugs, um, sort of changing your diet. So the brat diet is something we think of, bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. That can get really boring, so I would just use it as a guideline to eat bland foods. Um, brothy soups are great. Um, you sort of think of ramen, things like that. So a lot of noodles, things that are sort of easier to digest. Um, avoiding foods high in insoluble fiber, like fruits, um, seeds, skins, things like that. Uh, once again, small frequent meals. Um, and staying really well hydrated is important if you're having diarrhea frequently um, so that you're not coming into the clinic to get IV hydration and things like that, trying to stay ahead of, um, of your fluid intake. Um, so sort of talking about dermatologic side effects or the side effects we see on your skin more. Um, rashes are really common with a lot of these drugs. I remember serafinib um, being one that we saw a lot of rashes with. Um, so definitely using milder soaps, avoiding anything with fragrances or anything that's alcohol-based. So you really want to uh, become a little bit more intimate with the products that you're using. Flip it over and look at the ingredient list first. Um, if you see alcohol as one of the first things, I would just put it back on the shelf. Um, sometimes actually not showering every day, but every other day and, you know, um, can really help just to not dry your skin out as much and increasing the, the use of lotions, once again, not al alcohol-based lotions. Um, has anyone experienced hand-foot syndrome? Yeah. Can you tell the rest of the crowd what it was like for you? What did it show up as for you? Were they calluses, or did you have sores on your hands and feet? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, and how about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's how, actually why I asked because I think um, sort of each patient is so different and this is sort of representative of many patients dealing with these medications. Sort of trying, if one drug isn't working or if you're having too many side effects, you sort of go to the next and the next. And there's no way that, you know, you walking in the door, your oncologist won't know what side effect you're go going to get um, from these drugs. So some of it is trial and error and once again reporting the symptoms. It's important um, for us to all hear about these symptoms so that we can try to help or try to make a dose adjustment or medication adjustment if that's necessary. Um, I'll go through some of the things that um, I would recommend for helping with hand foot syndrome but I'd also love to hear from you if there are different things that you used. Um, using protective gloves like cotton gloves sometimes especially at night can be really helpful. Um, socks, comfortable shoes, Sometimes, you know, shoes can be difficult because some people will feel that sandals are most comfortable. However, if you have open sores, we, you know, would worry about the infection risk. So kind of introducing dirt and bacteria into open sores. 
Um, so try to, you know, maybe it's comfortable socks and Birkenstock sandals or something like that. But what's that? Ugly footwear. Ugly footwear, I know. It's not time for stilettos, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, avoiding hot water and soaking baths. Um, I remember seeing a lot of patients who would say they were soaking their feet, um, trying to use different things they'd seen at the pharmacy, and that's probably one of the worst things that you could do. Um, you don't want to do anything that will dry your skin out. So, you know, not using really hot water and avoid soaking um, is the best thing. Moisturizing creams are definitely your best friend. Um, using fragrance-free soaps, once again, nothing that is um, alcohol-based. One, at least one to two times a daily, if you could do three, depending on your schedule, um, that's, that's really helpful. Um, these are a few of the skincare products that have act actually have some evidence behind them, but they're not the only ones that work. Um, I actually put the Utter cream up there because I've heard from patients that it works the best, and it's hard to forget that label. <laughs> so it's a good thing to look for um, in your pharmacy. But things that we think of um, that are sort of extra greasy, like Aquaphor, can be very helpful, but you may want to use um, covering like gloves or socks for that. Um, did you use anything else that was helpful for you? Any other products? I use Cetaphil. Right? Cetaphil? It's really gentle. Yeah, that's another. Yeah, another great product. The Cetaphil also has. Um, they have a soap that's available as well as moisturizing cream. And it's actually something that they use on babies in the hospital quite a bit, so it is really gentle. So anything that's sort of uh, more on the gentle side you want to stick with. And I have some anti-itch um, creams available. I see a lot of people taking pictures with the iPhones. That's a great way to remember some of the information. Um, so mouth care is another, um, another issue that can be really important. Sometimes dry mouth, dry cracked lips, or even mucositis or mouth sores um, can occur with these medications. Probably not the first thing that, um, that I think of when I think of TKIs, but it can certainly happen. So using a water-based lip moisturizer is really helpful. Um, just keeping it in your pocket, your purse, your wallet, whatever works for you. Um, brushing two times, a, brushing your teeth is really important, but using soft toothbrushes or even sometimes they have sponges available at the pharmacy. Um, so any, avoiding anything that's harsh that will break down um, your gums is really nice. Um, once again, not using alcohol-based mouth rinses, um, nothing really harsh um, on your gums. So non-irritating mouth rinses, um, sometimes just normal saline like salt water, or you can use um, baking soda as well. That's really helpful and gentle on the gums. Um, floss daily if your platelets are actually high enough. Most, most of the patients on this drug um, have platelets which are high enough to tolerate that. And avoiding irritating beverages. When you have mouth sores, I'm sure you wouldn't really um, want to drink orange juice or anything like that, but certainly avoiding tobacco, um, spicy foods. And here are a few products, um, if you're interested, that are available, um, like Sensodyne, um, sort of anything that is, is soothing. Um, cardiac side effects are the next topic I want to talk about, and as a patient, there's not quite as much you can do about that. That's really more the job of your healthcare provider to be monitoring um, EKGs, um, you know, your blood pressure, all of those things. But many patients on these drugs are keeping a log of their blood pressures now at home. Um, I also found some applications you could get for free on your phone to keep track of that. Um, it's, I see a couple of nods. Um, and there are actually ways that you can, depending on the blood pressure monitor you have, you can plug it into your computer and load it directly so that when you go to your oncology appointment, you've got all that information available. Um, so it's important for you as the patient to tell um, your healthcare providers about any pre-existing conditions you have before we start these drugs. We usually ask pretty thoroughly, have you ever had a history of high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, any abnormal rhythms, heart attacks, strokes? Um, so those are definitely things you want to bring up before starting these drugs. We sometimes check um, serial EKGs um, to check the heart rhythm, um, looking at specific numbers just to make sure that these, they're not having any effects on your heart. Um, we would want you to report any symptoms like swelling, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, dizziness, or heart palpitations, which I'm sure you would do. Go ahead. What are some of the names that we have? Um, actually, I have one of, I can give you the blood pressure one. I actually wrote it down in my phone, um, so I can give that to you for the blood pressure one that I found. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about fatigue a little bit. Um, a lot of 
the side effects of not only TKIs, but many of the other treatments that are out there for kidney cancer, as well as just having kidney cancer alone, um, can cause fatigue. Um, so exercise is actually, it sounds counterintuitive, but it is really important. Um, there have been a lot of studies done in cancer patients um, that show that exercise does help the fatigue level, um, but certainly as tolerated. Like some of you were saying, if you've got foot sores that are so bad that you can't walk, you're probably not exercising a whole lot. Um, so trying to do as much as you can, even if you're sitting in a chair, at least you know doing some leg lifts or arm lifts during the day. Um, sort of balancing your day a little bit, planning activities so that you're um, alternating rest with activity. Um, I heard Jordan saying this earlier, accept help from others when it's offered. So if you're feeling exhausted and you, know, you need help, you know, maybe picking up you know, a parent that you used to pick up and help with other things or, you know, walking your dog or making meals. If other people volunteer help, say yes once in a while. Um, organizing your house a little bit so that tasks are easy for you to get done. Um, and prioritizing activities. So if you know you get really tired in the afternoon, don't, don't plan your appointments in the afternoon. Plan them all in the morning. Um, so there are a lot of causes of fatigue. It's it's sort of difficult to pinpoint in a 20-minute talk, um, but certainly some of the medications that I've mentioned today can cause fatigue, anemia, which can occur with kidney cancer patients, um, having low, thi uh, low thyroidism levels, which we can help with as well, um, pain, depression, sleep disturbances. Um, there are many reasons for this, so sort of talking with your healthcare providers to pinpoint um, the cause can be most helpful. Um, I've listed some of the causes, like anemia, of course. Occasionally we give um, blood transfusions or red blood cell boosters, injections that we give. Um, hypothyroidism, we can give supplementation for that. And that is actually pretty common with TKIs. Um, there are other drugs, of course. Um, sometimes if fatigue is so severe, we use things like psychostimulants, um, which can help, like many of you have probably heard of Ritalin. Um, but these are things that we would sort of avoid unless they're... Um, more severe. Um, Provigil. Multivitamins can help just if it's a nutritional cause. Um, and antidepressants or therapy to help if that's, if depression is really the cause of the fatigue. And lastly, I just want to say that dose reduction is um, sometimes necessary to help with these side effects. Sometimes no matter what we do, no matter what creams or lotions we use, we really can't control the side effects. So sometimes reducing the dose or the schedule, like Sutent, for example, is usually given for four weeks on, two weeks off. Um, some patients find that two weeks on, one week off, that modified schedule will help enough that they can continue taking the drug um, to help treat their kidney cancer while tolerating the side effects of the drug. Um, so don't be discouraged if, um, if you need a dose reduction or sometimes a change in therapy. As we, um, as I heard you know, someone say in the audience, you've been through several of these different treatments um, because of side effects. So.